because we reach any day in the old cell, just as rebirths, it is only for the minds to channel as a label is we also chance in our group. Um, you mean the chant of um, just as rivers flow to the ocean, the merit that I'm making, may it flow to the, the dead relative? Lay people can chant this. Um, it's traditional for Sangha to chant it as an animodana in response to an offering of food or other requisites. But a lay person can chant it when you're dedicating merit. You're at home, you can chant it. If you find it inspiring and uh, helpful, it's not wrong to chant it. You can learn that chant as well. Okay, thank you. And also, I have another question about the Balita that you just chanted. It is also okay for us to chant all the sutras in Balita, or the certain sutras as a lay Buddhist would that allow to chant. Yep. It's definitely okay to learn the paritas. Best of all is learn them off by heart. You start with the book, but once you do it regularly, learn them off by heart. Then you can chant them any time, any place, and you tend to chant with more vigor, more powerful mindfulness and emotion if you've remembered the words. Um, it's easier for samadhi to arise, easier for wholesome states to arise if you can learn the chants and put the book aside. But in the beginning, we use the books, and it's fine for you to chant the paritas. People find them very inspiring. Um, they arouse faith, energy. It's a good thing to do um, on special occasions, you know, like a birthday or a special occasion. You can chant the paritas. It's a good thing to do when you're feeling sleepy and you find meditation, you're just falling asleep. Well, you can put effort into your chanting. It's a good thing to do when you're feeling, you know, afraid. So people, you know, they often chant paritas before they have to go for an operation in hospital or um, when they're just feeling nervous or afraid about something in their life, they chant the paritas to steady their mind. Um, I often tell people stories about times, you know, when monks chant the paritas because they're afraid of ghosts or at wild animals. Um, or a funny story when I was with Ajahn Anand once and we were driving in a bus in India and the roads were very dangerous that day and everyone in the bus was getting very scared because the bus driver was driving so fast, dodging all the people and cows and camels and everything on the road. Everyone started to turn to the monks, say, what can we do? We're so scared. So then we started chanting the Paritas. We've got everyone chanting the Paritas together in the bus it didn't slow the bus down. <laughs> the bus driver carried on driving as fast as he possibly could, but at least we didn't crash into anything. <laughs> so it can help you at those times when you're feeling nervous, unhappy, or sleepy. You know, it can be a very powerful force in your life, or, or just as a time to celebrate the, the Dhamma, remember the Buddha, remember the Dhamma, the Sangha, and you're just celebrating by chanting. And they always, they always say, chant loudly, and then the devas will hear, and they'll come and uh, join in, and, and you'll get a very good feeling when the devas come to listen to your chanting. So don't be shy, chant loudly. Thank you. Uh, I have a, a last question as well. Sometimes when I came across some animals killed in the road, or I used my friend's parents and stuff to pass away because of cancer or something, so I want to know if there's anything special, I don't know if it's a bar or not, it's a, anything that I can do or I can check for them while I pass on, maybe I just stop for a second, serious sort of problem and I go on. So what is the recommended um, um, option so that I can do for them? Yeah. Thank you. Um, well, you can chant, a very commonly chanted one is the Metta Sutta, Karaniya Metta Sutta. Tonight we only chanted half of it, but you could chant the whole chant you know, uh, from the beginning through, and you can do it in Pali if you've learnt it, or you can do it in English, but I'd learn the Pali uh, because it seems to have a little bit more strength to it. And you can chant that for someone who is dying, very sick, or even after they've died, 
for an animal in the same way and then you dedicate the merit of that chanting to the the either the animal or the person and it helps you to calm down steadies your own mind helps you to remember the dhamma develops a good feeling it develops a wholesome state of mind and that's what you can share with with the dead animal dead dead person <coughs> Good evening, all. Um, I wish you all well and happy. Um, my question is in the uh, second noble truth, the origin of suffering is uh, attachment, and then um, we also know that suffering is caused by karma and kesa, and uh, craving is. Uh, Yes, it would be correct to say suffering is caused by kilesa. Um, kilesa is like all the groups of thoughts rooted in greed, anger, delusion. But there's many kinds of kilesa. Um, <clears throat> and when the, what the Buddha said is kilesa are like visitors to our mind. When the conditions are right, greed will arise, anger will arise, jealousy will arise confusion may arise in our mind. When, when the causes and conditions are right, it will come up into the mind. So these kalesas are not the same thing as the mind, they're like visitors. They're mental states that visit the mind and because of that truth, then they can be abandoned and let go of because they're not the same thing. They're not <clears throat> always there, they're not inher the mind is not inherently defiled with defilements, with kilesa. So that gives us the chance to see them when they arise and then abandon them, knowing that they're the cause of suffering, you can abandon them. And the whole Buddhist practice is based on this principle, is that kilesas can be abandoned and you can improve your experience, your mind can improve or be purified slowly or fast, depending on your efforts until you get to the point where no kalesas are arising at all because the mindfulness and wisdom is so clear kalesas can't can't affect you anymore there's no point the mind knows if you are, if you follow a kalesa you'll suffer therefore don't want to follow it don't want to hold on to it you can see it it's impermanent and it's not self so an arahant you know they don't have any kalesas anymore they've reached nibbana which means free from kalesa but we are still practicing with kilesa, so a lot of our practice is about be developing enough awareness, clarity, mindfulness and wisdom to recognize kilesa when it's at work. And they're very tricky. They sneak in, they're like sneaky uh, what do you call thieves or, or robbers or criminals and they sneak into our thinking all the time. So sometimes we have very obvious kalesa, you know, something goes wrong and we get angry and upset and it's, we know oh, this is kalesa, but it may take us a while before we can calm down and let go of that kalesa. Other times the kalesas are very subtle and sneaky and so maybe you even do some good in your day. Maybe you help somebody in your day, you help a family member or you go to work and you help somebody and that's a good thing to do. But then later on you remember what you've done and you start thinking, oh, I'm a good person. <laughs> I helped somebody today, I'm a good person. And already your action is turning into a kilesa because you're building up a sense of attachment to that sense of pride in being a good person perhaps. It's just an example, but kilesas are like this, they sneak in everywhere. So. Our teachers encourage us always to be vigilant, on guard, careful, because kalesas can come along anytime. 
But just as they can come into the mind, they can be taken out again. We can let them go, abandon them. When we have the wisdom, we can do that. And so there's, there's always hope. However much suffering you experience in your mind, there's always a chance to improve things by letting go of Kilesa. Um, well, it sounds like you understand what you have to do. Um, many people find the practice of meditation, sitting with your eyes closed, very still, in the beginning is a little bit difficult. So you can certainly contemplate the Dhamma in any posture or in any activity. That's fine. And like you say, we a large part of our life we spend interacting with other people, talking, meeting with people, seeing people whether it's close up or on a screen or in, in our work or our daily life. And you certainly can contemplate, like you say, you just observe the world around you and use Dhamma reflection and wise reflection to understand better. And like you say, what you see in others reflect back. Do I, am I going to experience that? You know, so you see someone who's sick or someone who's aging and you say, mm, I will become the same. In the, in the case of <clears throat> other people's behavior, maybe you do notice, <coughs> excuse me, you notice someone else or you realize they're not telling the truth. 
your first job maybe for maybe to establish mindfulness and and not give in to anger or displeasure with that behavior but just to reflect once you're mindful you can reflect contemplate oh this person is probably making some negative karma for themselves by not telling the truth this will come back on them it's not helping them to be more at peace it's not helping them to understand the truth it's just prolonging their suffering so when you reflect like that it brings up compassion for that person because you're see, seeing they're making karma creating suffering for themselves so rather than getting angry your contemplation would lead to a, an experience of having compassion um, but also like you say you might come back to yourself and say do I tell lies still am I still is that a habit I have is it something I do and you having seen the suffering of that person's experience telling lies whatever you come back and you you see if you can improve your own behavior or just um, confirm to yourself well I'm not telling lies I don't tell lies and I don't want to tell lies and you see the value of keeping to the truth uh, as a quality that you a virtue that you want to develop and promote in your life so the good and the bad we see in others we can always bring back to ourselves, like you say and contemplate and see where we can develop more good virtuous behavior where we can abandon unvirtuous unskillful behavior um, but Lumpo charge it did point out one thing he said generally as human beings we spend too much time looking at other people and thinking about other people and it can be a great distraction and it only gives us a little bit of knowledge because you never quite know other people what they're really thinking or feeling so it's okay to spend a little bit of time on other people but spend most of your energy watching yourself you know Ajahn Chah said watch other people 10% of the time watch yourself 90% of the time because our biggest weakness is actually we're just not very mindful of ourselves we miss things we're not aware of what we're thinking what we're doing half the time that's where we need to improve our practice so put a lot of effort into becoming more mindful having more clarity about your own intentions your own actions moment by moment through your day and you'll find that this is where you get a lot of wisdom and 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 you'll get a lot of happiness from this as well Good. Very, very good. This will keep your mind more peaceful as you drive. Meditation. If so, how do we separate 
Well, in s the simple answer is yes, you can use it for both samatha and vipassana. Perhaps a, s a simple way of understanding it is if, if your mind is still plagued by the hindrances, sensual desire, ill will, sloth and torpor, restlessness, and agitation, and skeptical doubt, then you tend to use the Gaya Gada Sati, the contemplation of the body or mindfulness directed to the body more as a samatha practice to help you get beyond the hindrances, to quieten the hindrances and make the mind one-pointed and calm. Um, and the more calm and the longer periods of calm that you experience, then you, it's very simple to turn from Gaya Gada Sati as a samatha practice to contemplation of the three universal characteristics in light, uh, directed to the body, so seeing the body as impermanent and unsatisfactory and not self. It's very easy to switch between the two. Um, and some people just, like there's a disciple of Ajahn Mahabur called Lumpur Lee who died last year and some, he's famous for his practice of Gaya Gada Sati and sometimes we used to talk to him and he said basically from the time when he was a new young monk, any time he sat down and started contemplating the body, he'd become peaceful and get great insight every single time. Uh, it's a bit frustrating for those of us who find the body contemplation harder, but he said he always found it very successful and he didn't really have to distinguish between samatha and vipassana. He would start his body contemplation, the mind would go quiet and he'd just investigate. He said sometimes quite naturally a part of the body or an aspect of the body or the four elements or one part of the body would come up. Sometimes images, visions, nimitas. And he would, he said it would be quite natural, he would, um, <coughs> his own wisdom would lead the contemplation. So he never quite, he said he never quite thought about samatha and vipassana. He would just do this body contemplation and get far. But he would say for those who find it difficult, maybe use the, um, he would encourage you, you to use the meditation word buddho. So recollection of the Buddha, reciting the word buddho, and make your mind firm, calm, and then turn to contemplate the body once the mind is calm. He would teach that as well. So there's a little bit of room for flexibility and experimenting here. You could sometimes just sit down to meditate and start straight away with body contemplation. Other times you may take up another object such as the breath or buddho and use that to calm the mind first, get beyond the hindrances and then turn to contemplate the body. And this is partly a character thing, you know, some people's character it's more suited to contemplating the body than others. So some people need different objects to, to calm their mind first. So you have to experiment, see what, what works for you. But having said that, you know, something I've talked about and some of you have mentioned tonight, you know, contemplation of the body isn't just something you do when you're sitting with your eyes closed, cross-legged, meditating in a formal way. You can notice things about your own body and other people's bodies any time in your day and so it's something you can introduce into your life it's just noticing the aging of your body others bodies noticing the unattractive side of the body noticing um, you know when people are sick or, or, or approaching death you can contemplate that at any time so it's sort of like some, it's like becomes something that your mind opens up to and is more aware of increasingly through your life, and you get a lot of peace from that. It's just quietly contemplating the way uh, the human body, the physical body, or animals' bodies, you know, it, it ages, deteriorates, and goes towards the end of its life. You can do that contemplation any time. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, we'll finish here. We can pay respects to the Triple Gem uh, and end the session.